the Dragon Prince season 5 is here. I binged the entire thing and so far the general reception I have been able to find online on this season is that it is a huge step up from the last season. People even go in as far as calling it really really good and amazing and I don't see it. I honestly think that this season as a whole, it has good moments, which we'll get into in a moment, but this season as a whole probably is less coherent than the last one. And that's going to say something, right? Because the last one was a mess, <laughs> frankly speaking, and so is this one. So let's go through uh, a couple of my bullet points that I've written down, and this is all recorded off the cuff, first impression, so this opinion may change over time, and there might be a little bit of rambling going on here, which uh, I might look back on in a couple of weeks' time and thinking, you know, maybe it's a little bit more nuanced on that, but by and large, my first impression of this season is not positive. Except for a few things. First off, Rayla and Callum. Adorably awkward as always. Love seeing them, and if nothing else, everything else I'm going to say in this video, I'm going to keep watching the Dragon Prince for the remaining probably two seasons, as it seems right now, just to see their energy and their interaction, because they are fun. We didn't get a huge amount of it this season, but we don't need it, like, every episode front and center the entire time. Just, like, having them being together, they just have very, very fun chemistry, and I can watch that forever. So, if nothing else, just for that, I'm gonna keep coming back for at least season six, at this point, it's also watching the show mostly out of habit, and because some of these story elements that didn't get resolved in this season, which you could argue were set up cliffhangers, I would argue were just not well written and very irritating for a viewer, they do pique my interest enough to the point where I want answers. We'll get into that in a moment as well. The first thing that I have more to say about than just Rayla and Callum were being cute as hell is Viren's story in this entire series, but specifically this season. Because as per usual, Viren is definitely the highlight of the entire season. His first third of the season being asleep in a dreamlike sequence like we've seen in the past with Callum was amazing. It's everything you would expect Viren to have in such a nightmare dream sequence. Then the rest of the season, he is a zombie. He is catatonic. He doesn't do anything until he gets a visual that mirrors what he saw in a dream, which snaps him out of it. And I think we all seen this coming, the fact that, and I'm going to do that thing, which a lot of Dragon Prince fans might not enjoy me doing, uh, but I think is a good comparison. I'm going to compare to Avatar The Last Airbender because it is trying to capture much of that same energy. At this point, it does have its own identity, but it's it's a good point of reference, right? So, Viren is our Zuko. Is he as well done as Zuko? Arguably, yes. And that is high praise coming from me, because nothing else in this show, and I love the show as in, in general, but nothing else in this show is done to the same standard as Avatar The Last Airbender, which is fine, because Avatar The Last Airbender is as close as you're gonna get to, like, narrative perfection uh, in, in this medium, that being television. So Viren even getting close to Zuko is a huge compliment. It's one of the few compliments that I'm gonna give them. Viren doing anything it takes to protect the people he cares about, even the dark magic, without noting the consequences of that because he is so absorbed with the next issue he needs to solve is a very compelling story, a very compelling character trait, which I absolutely love. And this is the season where he literally looks into the mirror and sees what he has been doing. And he realizes, wait a second, I felt like I've had no choice doing all of these terrible things, but every single step of the way that was a choice that I made. It was a choice where the alternative would have meant something horrible, be it the starving of an entire kingdom, or half a kingdom, two half kingdoms, that's an entire kingdom added up together. 
be it the death of a very good friend, be it whatever, right? All of the things we've seen Viren doing up to the point where he declares war on Zadia is all done in an effort to protect his kingdom, his family, those people he cares about. He believes the elves to be a honest threat to humanity, which at that point, let's be fair, they kind of were, because they were at a stalemate, but they were in a, in a war. Not to say that Viren is a good guy doing all of that, but he has motivation to do those things. Now he realizes the things he did were in fact choices. It wasn't fate pushing him into the direction that it had set out for him. It wasn't the only thing he could have done. Those were all choices. And moreover, he finally notes that those choices he made now reflect on his daughter. And that is the very thing that snaps him out of it. And that boy itself is a powerful first third of the season for Viren. Except that's not where it ends. Because in the very end of the season, he snaps out of his catatonic state. He becomes conscious again. And that's when Erevos finally gets to talk to him. Hey, Viren, fancy seeing you here. Uh, okay, you're going to have to kill your children or, or your child, one of your children, in order for the spell to bring it back to life fully to work. And the first thing you think is, we've just gone over the fact that Viren would never do that. He wouldn't sacrifice Claudia for the world, and even if they were to go find Soren, who he is not on the best of terms with right, right now, he would not do that. So Viren's just going to let himself die, and that's going to be his redemption, his retribution. He's not going to do that. Until Erevos brings up, no, I, I, I know you're not going to do that. Of course you're not going to do that. You're a good guy. You, you, you're nice like that. You're not going to kill either one of those. So I've made sure there's a new child for you to sacrifice. The homunculus, as he calls it, the, the little fairy goblin thing that's been going uh, around with Claudia, Viren, and Terry for the last two seasons, seasons four and five, uh, because it was made from Erevos and Viren, it counts as a child of Viren, and as such is the perfect sacrifice. It's barely alive to begin with, so it's a good sacrifice. And even then, Viren chooses not to do that. Number one, because he now sees that he does have that choice of not doing it. He does have the choice of not sacrificing this animalistic, very much non-human thing even. Something that in the past he doesn't even think twice about. And lets himself die instead. And that is what he chooses. And he curls up under the full moon. I don't know if it was a full moon. It feels like, like cinematically, it should be a full moon. <laughs> he curls up under the moon to go to sleep knowing that the next morning he's not going to be waking up. And that's how the season ends for Viren. And if nothing else, that is what I'm going to come back for. I want to see what happens with Viren because we can't go through season six and seven without him in the picture. I don't see a world where the Dragon Prince works without Viren because... Erevos needs someone to manipulate on the outside of his prison. That used to be Viren. Viren is now resisting that. And without Viren, there's also no way to manipulate Claudia. So Viren has to stick around in some way, shape or form as a plot device, at the very least. So I'm very curious how that's going to end up going. That's been about 10 minutes of me praising Viren's story. And I also have one more note, uh, which is more of a light theory than it really is analysis. Uh, this, is, this video is a mix of everything all together, which we'll get to, especially when we get to the Erevos prison part. In a previous season, I think in the previous season, as a matter of fact, uh, Claudia tells Soren that if it weren't for dark magic, he wouldn't be alive. And at the time, I think I, and most other people probably, took that as what happened to him in season two, I believe, where he broke his spine and Claudia healed him with dark magic. This season, with Viren's fever dream, seems to imply that Viren's potentially first step into dark magic was to save Soren's life. 
I don't know where that's going to go or if that's going to become relevant in any sort of way or if that's just a little bit of backstory, implied backstory for that matter. It's not even like very explicit because it's one line in a previous season combined with a fever dream in this season. So I'm not entirely sure if that's going to be relevant in any sort of way, if that's going to pop up in uh, one of the future seasons, maybe to humanize Viren a little bit more in the eyes of Sorin and start to repair that relationship uh, for the long term. I'm not entirely sure, but that's something that I did note and I did want to say, uh, because that, again, uh, would be a very interesting through line, but also comes back to something that I don't like about this season and the last one, and that is the fact that these things are barely seasons. But let's go through my other bullet points first, talking about some of the less than positive parts, and then I'll try to wrap up with a analysis of why I think the issues I have with the past two seasons are there to begin with. So the season pretty much immediately starts with Callum saying, I've been researching the ocean Arcanum. I'm trying to learn ocean magic. And the instant he says that, he, everybody watching is like, okay, so that's going to be your character arc. That's your character arc in this season is trying to figure out ocean magic. And by the end of the season, in a moment of need, it's going to come to you and you're going to get it. And you would be excused for thinking that that is actually what ends up happening. Uh, it's not. It's not a character arc, Callum goes on. It's certainly set up. It's certainly foreshadowed, but there's no growth. He goes from mentioning that he maybe would like to do that, and he has been researching it, to just getting it. As opposed to how he learned a Sky Arcanum, where we actually actively see him trying to learn from... Other mages meditating, even though obviously that's not what ended up actually doing anything, but we see him working towards it. We see him trying to reach it and failing it, and then eventually, under very strenuous circumstances, attaining the Sky Arcanum. None of that is here. At all. None of it. Not even close. And this is where I really think this season fails because in the end the ocean arcanum is about letting go of the notion that you can control everything around you and i like that as a thing matter of fact i like the fact that they stated that way because there's never really been an explanation of what the sky arcanum is about we learn that in order to know something you need to learn it heart soul and body or heart mind and body or whatever something like that but we never really point out what Callum learns in order to unlock this sky magic. Here we actually learn it. He says what the Ocean Arcanum is about, and I like that. And that could have been a theme for this season, Control. And I feel like they intended it to be, but they didn't really get to it. They could have very easily made a few scenes where Callum is trying to exert his control over the ocean over water and maybe even link it back to because that is the way he practices sky magic is exerting his control over the sky and that would obviously fail because that is not how ocean magic works then on the other hand we have claudia which obviously her whole thing is in fact trying to control everything and everyone around her uh, with dark magic using the nature around her to gain power to control that nature in turn again to the point where her entire character goal for the last two seasons has been resurrecting her dad full time more than just the 30 days he's got even though viren actively constantly kind of just wants to die again but she takes control saying no you're not gonna die i'm going to save you it is so ingrained in her character that this is the most obvious thing to do and I feel like the writers knew that. And I feel like they tried. But they didn't give it enough explicit attention in this season for it to be an overarching theme for the season. And tie a character arc together for Callum. Make Claudia a good foil for Callum. And that would tie together the entire themes of the season. 
That's a very big missed opportunity, which I, again, think they attempted to do and failed for a number of reasons. And those reasons are that the writing in these last two seasons, and this season specifically, is very chaotic. Because that was the potential for the theming for this season. At least for those two characters. We also have, like, the whole Sunfire subplot, which is entirely separate from this, which, again, I'll try to get to that. Aside from theming, we also need a goal. In storytelling, generally, you want the plot to have a goal, and every character individually to also have a goal. And between that character, or group of characters for the plot, and that goal needs to be an obstacle. Again, for Callum, that goal is, I want ocean magic, and he attains it, without much obstacle in between. For Claudia, that goal is, I want to free Aravos, which, again, there's not much obstacle in between, other than we're just kind of on a boat waiting to get there. And sometimes we have to hide a little bit from a dragon, and one time I fight a dragon, which showed Claudia becoming more dark, definitely. I like that scene, even though it doesn't really fit into anything for this season, specifically in a multi-season perspective we've definitely been seeing claudia going more and more down a dark path uh, which is what viren is also seeing and that's now causing viren uh, to take a step back so i i think i can excuse that not fitting into the season because in the end i think that should have been a bigger part of the season so the fact that that even exists in there to begin with is a good thing but the goal for our main heroes is also get to the Erevos prison, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Because the season starts with a Chekhov's gun which never gets delivered. The season starts with Ezra finding out some critical information about Erevos' prison, which Claudia doesn't know. Without this information, it's made very clear that without the entire full picture, releasing Erevos is likely not possible. That's been made clear last season and reiterated again this season which takes away all sense of agency and suspense about the villain team getting to Erevos because they don't have the full picture so even if they get to the location so what they don't have the rest of the information required to free Erevos to begin with so why are our heroes even bothering going there right and that's the thing their goal isn't really to get to Erevos' prison. They don't have a goal. They just have wacky adventures and mention every couple of lines that are supposed to be going to stop Claudia and Viren. But nothing they do really feels like it ties very well together with that. Like, yeah, finding a boat to get to that place totally makes sense. And in character, it makes sense that Ezra would try to rescue those little baitlings. Totally makes sense. For that character. Not for the story though. Not for the plot. And this is a thing that I both have to applaud the writers for and also I think is overrated. Because everything that happens in this season and even the last season is incredibly realistic. This is the way things happen in real life. Like information comes up and never gets resolved and things come out of left field and, and that is how things work in real life. That doesn't make for good, compelling stories. And I think that these two seasons of The Dragon Prince are very, very good examples of that. And to get back to my point, uh, which I alluded to at the beginning of this video, I think that is the reason I dislike this season more than last season. And it's really sad for me to say that because seasons one through three, I absolutely adored. And maybe, who knows, when season 6 and 7 are out and it's one big story that you can just binge back to back to back to back, maybe these issues resolve themselves to a certain extent. Does that increase the quality of the entire thing overall? I would argue no, because it, per season basis, still, it, it's written very poorly. Season 4 had a very clear goal. It had way too many subplots, but for the main story, it had a very clear goal that they were actively working towards and the adventures that they went on were directly related to achieving that goal. Getting the location of Erevos' prison, which they failed that goal spectacularly, but they had a goal which they were actively working towards. 
this season, they have the idea of a goal, which doesn't make any sense to begin with, as I mentioned before. And then a significant portion of the obstacles they face are self-inflicted, which have nothing to do with the actual goal that they're trying to reach. Making this season have much more of a problem with focus than the last season, in my opinion. Now, that said, the amount of subplots in the last season was definitely worse than it is here. Because here we have the even villain team, we have a very limited amount of Sunfire subplots, and then we have the main hero team. Whereas the main hero team was uh, split into two in the last season. So combining that back into one team, very much a good idea. Oh, wait a second. I did the thing that they did as well. I never finished a thought. Again, this is all live record. I don't have a script for this. I only have a few bullet points that I'm going off here. Um, so the Chekhov's gone, right? The season starts with Ezra learning something about Erevos' prison that is very important. And every rule of storytelling screams at you that that piece of information should be used by the end of the season. If something is set up, it should be delivered, especially if it's like central to the plot, right? In this case. And to a certain extent it is, except the viewer is never informed as to what this is. And this is not a cliffhanger. This is information baiting. Because it wouldn't have taken too long for Ezra to just like throw out a line or two to explain what the crystal ball thing is, because presumably that is Erevos' prison, but there's reasons to believe that it's not as well. Um, and I, I do think that this is semi on purpose to spur on online theory crafting, uh, because it seems like conflicting information. And getting into a little bit of theory crafting here, I fully believe that this thing is a red herring, that this is not Erevos' prison, because I am of the opinion that Erevos' prison is the cube, the, the key of Erevos, right? And the way to open it is to have all six primal sources probably um, act on it at once or something like that. That is my theory and has been for a long while. The fact that that didn't get explained what that orb was, just saying this is Erevos, this is the prison of Erevos, or this is... I, I don't know what it is, is the issue, so I, I can't tell you what a dialogue could have been because I don't know what it is and that is the issue there's time and again attention has been put onto the fact that there's this unknown piece of information that Ezra gets told at the beginning of the season which doesn't get resolved and out of all of the threats that are built up in this season and not resolved this is the one that bothers me the most because let's talk about that there's two other things one other thing you could argue but I see them as two other things uh that don't get resolved here but set up and feel entirely out of place. And that is the uh, Starkling Elf Sword. I don't know what it's called anymore. And at that same location, there's those uh, diamonds that uh, you can use for star magic. Okay, that's fine. That is clearly going to be the be all and end all, the way that the series finishes, right? Erevos is going to return after all in some way shape or form they're going to need to find that sword and while they're there they can finally release everybody in the cursed coins that's painfully obvious why do we need to set that up now and why do we need those two things to be one in the same location and two discovered within minutes of each other that feels really ham-fisted in there and i don't like that not at all it's fine and even good to have a through line between different seasons. Don't get me wrong. But just throwing some information at your viewer that they then can entirely ignore until a later season where it gets brought back up again and becomes a plot line. If you're going to do that, you need to tie that information into something that is relevant in this moment. And I don't know how they could have done that with this. So the best way to do that would have been to not include that in this season. The real best way to do that would have probably been to split up the team again, one team going to the Arrowverse prison, one team going to get the sword. But that would have then had the issue with too many subplots again, so I'm glad they didn't actually end up doing that. Let's take Avatar again as an example, and let's talk about lightning bending real quick. Because, or lightning generation and redirection. I, I don't like calling it lightning bending for reasons that I could make an entire separate video on, which I probably will not do. We see 
in the first season, Iroh redirecting lightning, and we're all like, okay, that makes a certain amount of sense. Lightning is kind of like very hot fire, so redirecting it, that, that makes sense that they can do it. Then in season two, we see Azula being able to generate lightning, and even within that same episode, we again see Ira redirecting it, I'm pretty sure. And then throughout the rest of that season, we see Zuko learning that actively. So by the time that gets introduced, that feels natural. But both of those instances of lightning redirection and lightning generation previously are tied into other things. In the first episode there, the ship is in the middle of a storm and Iroh redirects the lightning as more or less a throwaway gag that ties in with the action that's going on at that moment. Then we see Oazula is like very high level firebender, she can generate lightning and Naturally, we have seen Iroh redirect lightning before, and we reinforce the idea that you can redirect this lightning as well. And at a time where we actually get into the plot about lightning redirection, it feels natural, because it's been set up before in a way that wasn't ham-fisted. That is the way to do things. You tie in information that's set up for later into information that is relevant right now. You don't just throw it at your viewer and expect them to remember it for when it becomes relevant. I must say that the Sunfire Elf subplot uh, this season was a lot less annoying and a lot less bothersome for me. Uh, I feel like it got the same amount of screen time roughly as last season, uh, but this time there were just three plot lines instead of four. So comparatively it felt smaller as well. And I, st I still don't like the fact that this is a running subplot that's going on here. Unless they tie it all back together in a genius way in season 6 or 7, uh, I feel like this should have been its own season, like, in between season 3 and season 4. A season about, or two seasons even, about humans and elves learning to live together before we get into the whole Erevo story. That would have made a lot more sense. And that is kind of the issue with the previous season and this season, and I am willing to bet the next two seasons as well, is that they're trying to tell a lot of stories at the same time. And that doesn't work when you have nine episodes a season that are about 25 minutes in length. Because you only have about, what does that make, three and a half, four hours of content per season? Y you can't tell three or four stories in that time and all give them the time they deserve. And then also spend time setting up future stories. That doesn't work. The reason seasons and arcs are split up is because you, you want to be able to focus on the story developing at hand and that is the way you allow yourself as a writer to create depth in your story and a very cynical part of me thinks that this wishy-washy chaotic way of writing a lot of stories at the same time intermingling with each other every now and then isn't because there's going to be some grand finale where all of these stories did need to happen at the same time uh, without resolution because their resolution is all going to be the exact same moment. That is the only way that this makes sense if they do that, but a very cynical part in my brain says writing this way is a very good way to fill up your show with a lot of content without needing to go too much into depth. And I'm not entirely sure which one it is. I want to believe that it's an ambition to make a finale that absolutely blows everybody away because that is the way you do that if you want a finale that blows everybody away you have a lot of plot lines that all independent from each other don't have a resolution and the resolution for all the storylines come together in one big finale i won't deny that and if that ends up being the case again there is an argument to be made for watching the entire show a couple of years down the line once it's entirely been finished. Maybe all of the issues we have now, which are largely on a per season basis, and when I say we, I mean mainly me, because, again, I feel like most people enjoy season five. The issues that I have now and most people had with season four are mostly on a per season basis. I, I think the show as a whole, in some ways, still suffers from that, but probably can compensate for that relatively well. That is my hope, anyway that once the entire story is done, everything falls into its place and retroactively makes all of the issues I have here significantly less problematic. 
That still doesn't excuse the whole setup without delivery. So that is my thoughts on the Dragon Prince Season 5. Largely, there is a little room for improvement, and I do hope that that improvement gets made in Seasons 6 and 7. Although with the foundation that they've built now for this story arc, I don't think it's possible to really course correct too much anymore, and they just kind of have to keep going on this course at this point, and just really, really, really put a lot of effort into sticking the landing to retroactively fix a lot of these issues that we are seeing here. And then I have two more notes, which I can just really quickly go over. Uh, the Blood Moon Elf, absolutely love that. I said I was only going to be positive about Viren in this video. That's entirely incorrect. I love the Blood Moon thing. There's nothing more to say than just, I love that. It was a very fun action-based character. I really liked the characterization for this character, especially since this is the same kind of elf, at least originally before, like, they cursed themselves or whatever. This is the same kind of elf as Rayla, one of our main characters. And it, <laughs> you wouldn't think it from just, like, looking at her. Uh, so I, I really do, do uh, appreciate that. And another thing that I really noted is in the last season, we had to go underground to go talk to uh, the, the big ground dragon. And that's why Zubeya couldn't join our heroes. And this season, Zubeya got bit by a uh, corrupted panther, which meant that our heroes were on their own and couldn't get help from Zubeya. Again, which seems to just be hand-waved away at the end of the season by some fucking earth blood elf, maybe. Kind of looked like a toad, not gonna lie. Like a, a toad like from Mario, the mushroom people. Showing up and presumably just straight up healing her. Uh, so next season, she's probably going to be back in action, maybe. I was kind of looking forward to the idea of the Dragon Queen getting corrupted uh, and that then tying back into the idea that uh, what's-his-face, Saul, Saul something, um, the other dragon, the previous Dragon King, right, uh, getting healed with the Sunseed and that then creates that power struggle because the Dragon Queen is corrupted, clearly needs to be taken down. And then we have a human-hating King of the Dragons again, and that creates some extra conflict, and that can be resolved when Erevos gets released and they need to team up after all. But it seems like Zubeya is getting healed, so literally the only reason she was bitten wasn't to set up any interesting plots there, it's just to take her out of the equation, because otherwise she would have been too overpowered as a part of the team. It's a bit different from the usual content that I uh, make on this channel. Uh, maybe I'll do this a little bit more often in the future uh, with movies or, or television or whatever, uh, if this is something interesting. Maybe I'll make specifically more Dragon Prince content, especially about specifically this season, <laughs> uh, because this is just my first impressions again. I'm going to re-watch the season at some point uh, in the next few days uh, to see how a second viewing might change my mind, and maybe in retrospect I will end up loving this season. Uh, I must say, my first reactions, which I didn't record in a video, but my first reactions on season 4 were relatively positive, and the more I thought about it, the more negative they became. So, I'm hoping that the opposite will hold true for this season.